Hi, everybody. We're back. We're here to talk about the two witnesses today in Revelation chapter 11, all the way to verse 14. So we're going to move a long ways with what we've been doing the last few videos. So we're going to talk about the two witnesses, the trampling of the holy city, the three and a half years. We're going to go into a lot of detail on that, showing what that is. And then these two themes that run throughout the chapter 11. So first, I want to give you a little bit of an overview of the whole chapter, because if I read through it, and you have no idea what these things or what idea I have of these things. You're going to have these preconceived notions of the way you see it. So he's measuring three good things, the temple, the altar, and the worshipers. We already spent a lot of time on that. I'm just going to go through it really quickly today. Uh, just a few things on it. But those are the Christians. That's who that is. Those are the three things. The temple, altar, and worshipers. The court and the city don't measure. That's given to the nations. Those are the evil people. Okay? They're going to trample the court and the city for 42 months. That's not physical court. It's, it's us in a sense. Okay? So keep that in mind. I know it's going to be difficult until I explain it. He's going to give power to his two witnesses. He says, my two witnesses. That's Christ's two witnesses for 1260 days. They are the two olive trees and candlesticks. It's not a literal olive tree or a candlestick. Standing before the God of the earth. We're going to go through all that. I believe that's God. Out of their mouths is fire. There's no rain. Prophecy. They, they prophesy. And they turn the waters to blood. So it's just like Elijah and Moses. So that's what they're doing to the church. When they finish their testimony, the beast will make war and kill them. Their bodies shall lie dead in Jerusalem for three and a half days. This is all parts of what we're going to talk about in these two themes. But basically, that's the church. And I believe that's not actually what happens to them. But um, you're going to see how we dial all that in. But basically, it's going to appear like they're dead. And then the spirit of life enters them, and they stand on their feet and ascend to heaven. So once again, it's the church. So I, I just wanted to say that was before we get in and read all these verses, I want to tell you a little overview. So when you read these, you kind of get an idea of what I'm thinking about these as, I'm, as we're reading the verses. So if you missed any of the old ones, go to Scars for Thomas on YouTube or go to my website, scarsforthomas.com. There's other stuff you can read there and you can send me an email if you've got any questions or any ideas or comments. That would be great. I'd love to hear from you. So I'm going to read through these 14 verses. And there was given to me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and shall kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. 
And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. So all the way through chapter 11 are these two themes, and I'm going to go over them here briefly, so that when we go through these verse by verse, you should see one of these two themes basically all the way through Revelation chapter 11. Theme one, the church is a type or part of Christ, and chapter 11 has allusions to Christ, or so you're seeing things of Christ that is actually happening to the church. So Christ is the head of the body, or the church. The church is the body. So Christ is the head, and the church is the body. The church is Christians. That's what we are. That's what we are. Christians. That's the, what the word come from. Christians are Christ followers. So if Christ does something, we follow in his train and do what he does. Christians abide in Christ. And you see all these verses I have in here. If you want to look them up, this has the verses that go with it. Christians sacrifice themselves as Christ did. In a sense, that's what we're doing. We make our bodies a living sacrifice. Christians are to be Christ-like. So all these are in this one theme that we're going to be seeing Christ as we're looking through this chapter. The other theme that goes through this chapter is theme two is the law or Moses and the prophets, which Elijah kind of represents them, give way to the Holy Spirit, which is the church. The church has the Holy Spirit indwelling in it and Christ, which we are, we are abiding in Christ. So the Holy Spirit replaced the law of Moses. We now, we don't follow those old laws there's a new one. The second one, the first one, if they were, the first one was perfect, there would be no need for a second covenant. The second covenant is the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. We now know how, how to behave because of the Holy Spirit and the Scripture too. John the Baptist was a type of Elijah. So Elijah is no more... John the Baptist paved the way. He was the last one in the law, and I'm going to get to that. So he paved the way for Christ in the church. We'll go into all this. We're going to prove all these things I'm saying here. As we go through this chapter, we're going to see them all unfold. The church are now the prophets. We're now the prophets. We're now Elijah. We're now that, the kings and priests. And there was given to me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. So, just briefly, I'm going to go over this, this 15 by 15 naos, the inner temple. The temple is growing in this revelation into this 15 by 15 feet, into 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles cube-shaped city which is the new Jerusalem. So you'll see this naos is growing out into this whole city. It was a little small cube, now it's going to be a big, huge cube. Just like we see the Borg here, show the little one, it's growing into a big one. So this whole city grows into a holy temple. This is in Ephesians 2, 18 through 22. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. There's only one spirit, and that's how we do it, through Christ. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners. You are no more the strangers and foreigners. You're now part of Israel. See, he's going to say this here. You're part of Israel, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You're fellow, you're a citizen of Israel. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So it's Old Testament and New Testament. Together as one. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. 
in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. So the, the whole thing, Israel, is one big temple all together. Old Testament, New Testament. See it now as this signified as a small little temple growing into a huge 1,500 mile cube in whom we also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. That's inside us. Inside us in the Spirit. In our spirits. Through the God. The habitation. So our, the, this holy temple is inside of us. But the court which was without the temple leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. First of all, I just wanted to say that the temple must have existed at that time in order for it to be a frame of reference. It doesn't really make sense that the way they're phrasing it here, that it would be exist, or that they would phrase it this way if it didn't exist. If the temple was already destroyed, they wouldn't say these things this way. They wouldn't say to measure the temple and stuff. It would be kind of nonsensical. Okay, I just want to say that, even though that's not what it's about. It's still, they wouldn't say it, and I, I know I said this early in the, my teaching, so I wanted to go over it again really briefly here. But if you really think about it, you wouldn't be talking about measuring the temple if it didn't exist. So, just saying that. Wouldn't be a good frame of reference. But they're using it, God's using it as a frame of reference here. So the temple is measured and protected, but the court and the city are not measured. They're given to the Gentiles, so they're not protected. Where the city, the temple is protected. This doesn't really make sense for the, the, the Orthodox preterists, the way they'd say this, because they, they take this literal, like this is all going to be destroyed by the Romans. But wait a second, no, the inner part of this isn't. The temple is not being destroyed. And the Romans did destroy the temple. They destroyed all of it in 70 A.D., that's how we know this isn't about 70 A.D. It's one of the main, this is the main proof that it's not. So the court here, you see in this map or this drawing here that shows the courts are right on the, either side of the temple, the outer courts, and then the city is outside of that. And it's saying both don't measure either of them. So I kind of think of them as one and the same, I believe. I think that's what they mean here is they're one and the same. The city and the court are kind of the same. They're given unto the Gentiles. You could see, you know, it's because that whole area, I believe, is given to the Gentiles. The only thing that isn't is that little small red square there. So we are the new Jerusalem. I spent a lot of time on this already, but so that temple that's being measured is our spirit, uh, the outer court, maybe our soul. And then the city would be our body. But the main important thing here is, is our spirit is what's protected. It's not given unto the Gentiles to trample. Okay? But our soul and body are not protected. The soul and body are the carnal part of you. They're the part that has access into this world that we live in. But our spirit is in the heavenly realm. So it's fully protected by God. You see here it is sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It's a little different meaning in that, but regardless, the, the main point here is that our soul and body, yeah, the people of this world that are controlled by Satan can hurt our body, obviously. They can, the people of this world can hurt our soul. You know, your soul gets grieved when your body gets hurt. But they can hurt your feelings. They say something bad about you. That hurts your soul. It doesn't hurt your spirit. Spirit, your spirit's perfectly protected. So here's another chart. The Holy of Holies is the inner, and then you got them in the courtyard and the land in Jerusalem outside. So the Holy of Holies would be the temple, the naos. That's what's being protected, our spirits. So it's given to the Gentiles. The Gentiles really is nations. Some translations render it nations, and I think it's good. I think nations is good. Gentiles is good too, just as good. What is the nations? Or what is the Gentiles? Here you can see this interlinear here shows nations. And it says for 1484, that word is ethnos, which is like ethnic for us. It means a race or a nation or the nations. 
distinct from Israel. We are Israel, so that's given to the Gentiles, the opposite of anybody who's in Israel, part of the church, are the saints. The saints are all people, Old Testament, New Testament, all people who are in Christ. So this is the worshipers versus the nations. See, so the worshipers are those three things. The first good people that were measured are protected. Ethnos, properly people joined by practicing similar customs or common culture. Nations, usually referring to unbelieving Gentiles and non-Jews, they say there. So we, being the New Jerusalem, we are part of the commonwealth of Israel. So we are not the Gentiles anymore. This is something that Steve Gregg wrote in his book, uh, Empire of the Risen, Risen Sun. And I'm going to read it for you here. As the descendants of the first rebels migrated across the habitable earth, they formed ad hoc cooperative societies to make their lives easier. Some of these communities grew large and leaders arose among them. These groups eventually multiplied to, according to the Jewish tradition, 70 ethnic entities called in Hebrew, Goyim, Greek, ethnoi. This is the word translated in scriptures as nations or Gentiles. These nations, having been spawned by rebellious parents, also chose to live in rebellion against God, who as creator of all properly owns all people and all things. Instead of acknowledging him, they established rival religions honoring grotesque demonic gods represented by images carved from wood or stone. This understandably was taken by God to be a deliberate affront, a blasphemy that caused him to withdraw his self-revelation so that they might be left to their own errors. So the court and the city is given to the goyim or the Gentiles. So there, this is the non-believers. And they trample the holy city. Who's the holy city? We are the holy city. We are the new Jerusalem that's going to be coming out of the, 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 the heaven from God in Revelation chapter 21. We are the new Jerusalem that they are trampling. The outer court and the city equals Jerusalem or the new Jerusalem, like you see in this chart. So that's what they're trampling, is us. We are no longer aliens from Israel. We are Israel. Wherefore remember, ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So you were that before. You weren't part of Israel. Now you are. This is, what, this is what Paul's saying. You can't get around this. You are Israel. You once were Gentiles in the flesh. You're no longer. You all made to drink in the one spirit. This is all about the Holy Spirit, this chapter, whether ye be Jews or Gentiles. You're all in that one spirit. All drink into that one spirit. What does it mean to tread underfoot? And I believe that means to not consider holy. When somebody's treading underfoot, they're saying our bodies or our souls, they're not considering that holy. See, this is all about the holy place. The inner sanctum, that naos, is the most holy place, the holy of holies. Our outer court is a holy place too, but they don't have access to our, the inner sanctum. But they do have access to our souls and body. See, and that's what they're going to tread underfoot for the 42 months. That's, the, that's what it hasn't been protected, say, by God. And that's the whole point of this. To tread means to trample. Same thing you see Isaiah saying you could tread my courts or trample my courts. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Once again, not to consider something holy is to trample on it over and over. 
Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. See, this holy, it's like you have something holy, like something that's precious, like the pearls. You wouldn't throw them to the swine, or they destroy them. He's talking about doctrine. He's not talking about, he's talking about the good things, and you don't give what you have, your holy things, your doctrine, your, uh, your, well, you could even say like the things in the temple, all the holy, uh, the, the, the candlesticks and those types of things. You wouldn't throw those to the dogs. Those are holy. You cherish those. You wouldn't, so when, you, when you're trampling something, because they're going to trample it. The Gentiles are going to trample it. And that's what he's talking about here in this. Jesus says, don't give your holy doctrine to, to swine. This is when he's talking to the Gentile woman and she's wanting to get, she wants healing from, for her daughter. And he answered and said, it is not made to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. So the idea here is, he's saying, I'm not going to give my, the good stuff to the Gentile woman, this Gentile woman. She's a dog. They're unholy. Dogs can't go into the holy place. Dogs don't get the, the, the good stuff. But then she, she, she said she humbled herself, which all it takes to become part of the covenant Become part of the people is to humble yourself. And then he said, great is thy faith, is what she said. Because she humbled herself. See, when you humble yourself, you make yourself holy. You're making yourself holy. So then she's worthy of it. You see that? But she's a dog before. A dog. What's a, why is this so important? Because I'm going to get this next verse here. But the dogs are the Gentiles. They're the goyim. The, the non-believers. In other words, he's saying, you're not a believer. And then she, she showed him that she was. Blessed are they do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and they may enter through the gates unto the city, but without are dogs. See, the dogs are the, the non-believers. Sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and make a lie. This isn't really dogs. This doesn't mean dogs physical Dogs with four legs. This is talking about unbelievers, Gentiles, the goyim. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Once again, if, if you don't have any salt in you, you don't have any, anything good to say about God, you're worthless. You're no good. You don't have nothing in you. You're just a do-nothing person. doesn't have no salt in you. You have no flavor. You're not good for anything. You're not holy. You're not, you're, you're not worth anything, but just be thrown down and disrespected. That's all. You're, you're worth nothing. You're not worthy of no respect. No holy. Not consider holy. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. And we're going to get into that here in a second, the two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and had counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. So he's saying here that people in the Old Testament died with two or three witnesses without mercy when they broke the law. When they broke the law, they died without mercy. Two or three witnesses and they were put to death. How much sore punishment was somebody who trodden underfoot the Son of God? In other words, you don't consider God or the Son of God a holy thing. Or the covenant. So, 
He's saying here, if you think you can go do whatever you want, you're really not considering what Christ did for you and that covenant and what he did for you and what that sp the spirit of grace is all about. But always, always, almost always, I can't say always, but almost always when you see trodden underfoot, it's an idiom for an, uh, treating something unholy. And that's exactly what's going on here in Revelation chapter 11. They are trotting underfoot, the Christians, in our soul and body. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. My, my two witnesses. Remember who this is talking. This is the angel clothed in a cloud. That's who's talking right here. Who is that? It's Christ. I spent a lot of time showing that was Christ. John is bowing to him. This is Christ. They don't allow him to bow to angels. This is Christ. He's going to give power to two witnesses. Jesus says, who does Jesus give, who does Jesus give power to? Moses and Elijah? It's personal. So who are his two witnesses? I'm going to go first who Christ's two witnesses are not. Let's get those out of the way. And then we'll get to who they are, and I've already told you anyways. They're not literal candlesticks or olive trees. Man, I, I never heard a commentator say this, so it's kind of even silly to talk about it. But they're not that. We know they're not that. They're not two literal guys that are half candlestick and I mean that's some sort of science fiction thing or something. They're not literal fire-breathing men. And that's what a lot of people do believe. They believe this is whoever. I'm not even going to get to say the people now. But they believe they're two men that God sends here on earth that are fire-breathers. They're not Elijah and Moses. They can't be. I'm going to show you why. They're not Elijah and Enoch. And it's not the law and the prophets. Even though that theme runs through the law and the prophets, but the law and the prophets give way to the Holy Spirit, the church, Jesus. It's already happened. It already happened. So they're not literal candlesticks or olive trees. I already went over that. They're not literal fire-breathing men. Why not? Why aren't they literal fire-breathing men? In Luke 9, 54 through 56, Jesus is talking to the disciples, and the disciples wanted to, Jesus to throw fire down, have fire come down and kill these Samaritans because they disrespected them. They treated them unholy. They trampled them underfoot, so to speak. And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did, as Elijah. And he turned and rebuked them. Jesus did. And said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. This is the whole point here. We're in a new covenant here. This is a new game. God isn't sending people with fire breathers to come and destroy people. The church is here to save people. We're to love our enemies. Do good to those who despitefully use you. That's the New Testament. So who also they're not? Elijah. And why aren't they Elijah? This seems like he'd be a pretty good fit. Behold, this is in Malachi. I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite thee with a curse. Elijah was going to come to what? Before the day of the Lord. When is the day of the Lord? A lot of people talk about this, the day of the Lord, this is that. The day of the Lord could be many different things depending on the context. There's many different days of the Lord you see in the Old Testament. It's always when there's judgment or impending judgment coming on God's people. 
You can see that sometimes in the New Testament it says the day of the Lord Jesus Christ or the day of the Lord Jesus. But each one of these in different contexts mean different things. Now in Malachi, over and over, he's saying the great and dreadful day of the Lord. This is referring to 70 AD when Jesus came and judged by using the Romans to destroy them. Now this is, in Malachi was over and over all this ominous things that were written in Malachi, like in Malachi 4.1, For behold, the day cometh, it's the day of the Lord, that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, said the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. What does John the Baptist say? He said right in the beginning of his ministry, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees, Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is honed down and cast into the fire. So, John the Baptist was the fulfillment of Malachi 4, 5. He was the one that fulfilled that. He was the Elijah that came before the coming of the dreadful day of the Lord. The only person that came before Christ was John the Baptist, who was a type of Elijah. And then he goes on in Matthew, said, and he, whose fan is in his hand, he's talking about Jesus, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into his, to the gardener, which means the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. What is the chaff? That's the bad, the apostate Jews that he's going to burn, just like it said in Malachi 4.1. He shall burn them up. Elijah was the shadow of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the fulfillment of what Malachi is talking about in Malachi 4, 5. I will send Elijah the prophet before you. Elijah was a shadow. We don't expect the shadow to return. We already have the fulfillment. Why would the shadow come again? There's no reason for Elijah to come again. John the Baptist was the real deal. That's like saying that David is going to return, King David. No, he was the shadow of Christ, what Christ fulfilled. Christ was the real deal. John the Baptist was the real deal. Elijah was a shadow. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to their children. This is John the Baptist's ministry. His job was to turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Did he accomplish his mission? Did John the Baptist do that? Yes, he did. It's amazing because people just don't have spiritual eyes and spiritual ears to see it. Jesus talked about it in this next verse, Matthew 13, 13. Therefore I speak to them in parable, because they seeing see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, or Esaias which saith, By hearing they shall hear, and, and shall not understand. And seeing they shall see, and not perceive. It's both from Ezekiel 12, 2 and Isaiah 6, 9. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. So when did the law and the prophets happen? Until John. So after John, there's no more law and prophets. There's no more need for Elijah. There's no more need for anything. Law and the prophets had nothing to do with 70 AD. This happened, John the Baptist died before Jesus in the 30s. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, Elijah, which was for to come. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. It's that spiritual eyes and ears once again. You have to have the spiritual eyes and ears to get this. There's no way Elijah could be the one. He can't be. He can't come back. He already came. He don't need to come again. He already did his job. All the prophets until John. John was the guy. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets. There's no more need for him anymore. Jesus fulfilled it, everything. John already did his job. There's no more need to bring Elijah back. I've had this over and over. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. 
What is the Spirit? The Holy Spirit's telling us all this stuff. Who the two witnesses are not. Enoch. The reason people say this is because he didn't die. Really? Because he didn't die? That's the only reason they got. What did it say about you? This is all it says in the whole Bible, basically, about Enoch. There's a few other little things, but this is really all it says. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. There's a whole generation, or there's a whole bunch of people that aren't going to die. Paul talks to them about in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. That means people are going to be alive. So there's no really good reason to put Enoch in here. There's no allusions to Enoch whatsoever in this chapter. They just say it because he didn't die. That's not a good reason. How about Moses? If anyone, Moses seems to fit the bill too, just like Elijah. Look at we got all these Exodus plagues and everything. But remember, we're here in the wilderness, the time in the wilderness, chapter 10 through 11. We've already went through all these plagues all the way up to the sixth trumpet. And we're now in this time in the wilderness. And then we're going to go into the promised land. Just like Jesus was in the wilderness, being full of the Holy Spirit, he's led by the Spirit through the wilderness. That's like part of theme one. Well, we're a part of Christ. Christ is going through the wilderness. So that would be part of that theme. So we're following Christ through the wilderness. I already showed you this before. We're the two witnesses following him. So we all did eat that same spiritual meat and all did drink that same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock, followed them, and that rock was Christ. But many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Just like in Exodus with Moses going through the wilderness, Christ is going through the wilderness with them, with Moses. He was the rock. That's what it's talking about here is Christ is the rock. The rock was Christ. Paul says it clearly. This is where it says the Lord is the rock. He is the rock in Deuteronomy. He's the rock of the salvation. The rock and more in De Deuteronomy. But the thing I'm getting to with all this rock stuff is what did Moses do the first time God told him? He told him to smite the rock. And then the water come out because all the people were thirsty in the wilderness. And he, and he told Moses to hit the rock and the water came out, right? The second time, he told him, speak to the rock. Just like Christ was only smitten once, died on the cross. It's his only time. Second time, he was supposed to speak to it. But what did he do? He hit it again. So what did God do? He said, okay, you're not going into the promised land. So Moses, or Joshua, who is supposed to go into the promised land? Joshua, not Moses. Moses was never to enter the promised land. It says in her Numbers 20.12, he says, Ye shall not bring the congregation into the land which I have given them. Then he asks again in, in Deuteronomy 3.25, he says, Pray thee, let me go over. And God says, Speak no more on this matter. Moses is never going to go into the promised land. Physically, Moses. Jesus is, or Joshua, who is a representative of Jesus, is taking him the last leg. Moses took him most of the way through the wilderness, but Jesus is the last one going into the promised land. Moses can't go to Jerusalem. Period. So he can't be one of the physical guys here. I don't think they're physical guys anyways, but regardless, if they were physical guys, he couldn't be one of them. Because he can't go into the promised land. According to God, if you want to keep God's word, God said, no, you cannot. You will not go into the promised land. So physical promised land. He's going to go to the spiritual promised land. The heavenly Jerusalem, yeah, he's going to that. But the physical one, no, he won't. People will say, okay, well, what about the transfiguration? Who is that? That's Moses and Elijah and the transfiguration. This is a big part of this chapter, seeing this. Because this is so vital to what's going on here. This is the exact same thing that's going on in this chapter. Christ, was, he was transfigured before, and his face shone like the sun. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elijah, talking with him. 
And while he spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, Tell the vision to no man, until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Look at this here. How would Peter know who these guys are? He wants to make, you know, altars for them. How do you know that's Moses and Elijah? How does he know? Moses hadn't been around a long time. Same with Elijah. They didn't have pictures of him. They didn't have a Kodak of him. They don't know what those guys look like. You think he was, Moses was carrying the Ten Commandments? No, the reason he knew, because this is a vision. This isn't really Moses and Elijah. This is a vision. The whole point is this. This is showing when the law and the prophets ended. Right here, this is what this whole transfiguration is about. This happened well before 70 AD. This is what we're seeing here, that this is a transition that we take on. You listen to Christ now. This is who the one is. Hear ye him. You listen to Christ. You don't listen to them anymore. They're gone. They're done. It's already been fulfilled. The old's done. Christ fulfilled it all. Don't need them no more. So the law and the prophets. The temple being destroyed didn't end the law. That happened at the cross. It was already ended. When the, when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, that had nothing to do with it. You know, this is the thing too, you know. I just, I know I'm going after preterists a lot here. But I tried to make this fit in the preterist view and I couldn't. It just doesn't work. It's putting a square peg into a round hole. It doesn't work. I tried. And I, I tried and tried. And I see that some of their points, and they have good points, but you have to do some damage here to the text to make this fit. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit for 70 AD because the structure is meaningless. It's the only thing, the reason that had to be destroyed in 70 AD is because Christ gave a prophecy about it. The true end of the Old Covenant is a transfiguration. And when Christ died on the cross, and when he was resurrected. So who are his two witnesses? And I already said it, but let's just go through this little thing. I want to show you this little illustration real quick. That Mary, when she came up to the sepulcher after Jesus rose from the dead, and she looked in there in the tomb, she saw two angels on either side where the body is laid you know, the stone or whatever where the body was laying. I think that's kind of a little bit of a representation of the two witnesses. So you're seeing two witnessing the glory of God, just like on the mercy seat in the Ark of the Covenant. Those two angels are always witnessing the glory of God. So it's similar. So this is a little bit of a representation of the two witnesses who witnessed the glory of God. Well, we have access to the mercy seat. Now, we're right there in the Holy of Holies. It talks all about that in Hebrews. The other thing is that the, out of the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. You need two witnesses. At the mouth of one witness, it shall not be put to death. This is all about the death of the evil. And without the two witnesses, you can't kill the evil. So that's why there's two and not one. Because out of the mouth of one witness, it don't work. But with two, it does. Somebody who's worthy of death can be put to death. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin or any sin that he sinneth. Out of the mouth of two witnesses or out of the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. And that's what we're talking about. This matter that's going to be established is the church age, and the church needs two witnesses, not one. That's why we're considered two, not one. Moreover, if thy brother trespass against thee, go to him and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained a brother. But if he will not hear thee, that's what we're dealing with, the unbelievers, the people who don't listen, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. That's what we're talking about here. The two witnesses, the mouth, 
of two witnesses. This is going to be key when we get going here. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. Power comes from the true naos, the, the holy of holies, from God, from Christ. And th that's where the power comes. I will give authority. That's what NASB says. Same thing, power, authority. You only get that from Christ. Where do you get, when do they get the power? When do the two witnesses get their power? Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the earth. When do they receive that? In Acts, the day of Pentecost. That's when they got it. It's in chapter 2. It's when they received the, the Holy Ghost. We're not waiting for that. They're, they've already received the power. You don't have to wait till 70 AD. You don't have to wait till 2,000 years in the future for this to happen. This already happened. The two witnesses already got their power. The power is the Holy Spirit in them. And I will give power to my two witnesses and they shall prophesy. Can they prophesy? Well, this also says in Acts chapter 2. It shall come to pass in the last days. That's the last days was back then. That's what Peter's saying here. See, and this is the last days. Saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Was that happening? Yeah, it was happening back then. And your young man shall see visions, and your old man shall dream dreams. This isn't something we're waiting for. It already had, Peter said this already happened. And on my servants and on my handmaidens will I pour out in those days my spirit. When did they receive his spirit? See, it's my servants, my handmaidens, and my spirit. Who's that? It's God speaking. Whose is that? It's Christ. He's given the power to these. God. And they shall prophesy. Is that happening? Of course, it's already happening. They shall already prophesy. Can Christians prophesy? Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. And if anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let him first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that ye may learn, and all may be comforted. For ye may all prophesy. Who is he speaking to? Christians. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. Sackcloth is worn when someone mourns. So these guys are mourning. And it's the Christians. We're mourning through the church age. You should know that. We just should, I shouldn't even have to show you any verses. You should just know that. We're longing to be with Christ. We're the bride away from the groom. We want to be with the groom. Sackcloth is like a coarse, really scratchy. It's supposed to make you uncomfortable. You're supposed to be uncomfortable in the church age. You're not supposed to be living it up, happy, go lucky, whatever. You're supposed to be longing for Christ. Daniel mourned 70 years more in captivity. He, has, he set his face in the Lord to seek prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Those are all tied together. Fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. It's a very common theme. When someone mourns, that's what they do. They fast. They put on sackcloth and they put on ashes. It's in the Old Testament, over and over. Same with Mordecai. He did the same thing when, you know, he was mourning about the, the, the Jews are going to be destroyed. But anyways, he put on sackcloth with ashes. Because he's mourning. The other thing they do is rent their clothes sometimes. And he cried with a loud, bitter cry. When Jesus was taken, then they will mourn. The Christians. And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as a bridegroom is with them? But the days will come. When is that going to come? After he's gone. When the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then they shall fast. So the fasting goes along with the sackcloth and ashes. You just got to know that. This is one of the things I've discovered about this chapter. The days and months. And they got the good guys always are 1260 days when it's talking about the good guys and the bad guys it's always 42 months whenever you see these it ties them together 
So like here in Revelation 11.3, it says two witnesses receive power for 1260 days. It equals three and a half years. Then in 11.2, the nations tread the holy city underfoot 42 months. So you see those are the bad guys. So the good guys, 1260 days, the bad guys, 42 months. Then in Revelation 12.6, the woman flies to the wilderness 1260 days, which is three and a half years. All these are three and a half years. Then in 13.5, the two beasts receive power 42 months. The one receives it in the verse, but the other one receives it at the same time. So they're both receiving it at the same time for 42 months. So the two witnesses is equals the woman. So it's the same thing. It ties them together, that 1260 days, the two witnesses, the same thing as the woman. The two beasts, the same thing as the nations. So you could tie those together too, as they both have 42 months. They're basically the same things. So you have two witnesses and you have two beasts. Isn't that strange, the way that works? You think they planned that out? And I bet they did. And then the woman would be the counterpart of the nations. And the two witnesses would be the counterpart of the beasts. But they're both the same in a sense because the beasts are the same things as the nations and the witnesses are the same thing as the woman. And they're always tied together because they put those numbers. That's why they put those numbers different. There's no really other reason to put those numbers different. Or you just make them all the same. But they're tying those together. Those two verses and those two ideas. The two witnesses are the woman. The two beasts are the nations. Or the goyim. The non-believers. There's more to it than that. And I'll get more into the beasts when we get into chapter 13. This is the basic idea of it. He's the bad guys and the good guys. Chapter 11, verse 2. The nations tread underfoot the holy city 42 months. It's the bad guys time. There was given him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy and power was given unto him to continue 42 months. It's talking about the beast. It's bad guys time. Always tied together. There's one other thing I want to say about the 42 that also gives us a little clue this is a long period of time. It's not a short period of time. Is that the generations, and Matthew almost makes this artificial the way he does this. He puts this in Matthew 1.17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So you add those up. 14 plus 14 plus 14 equals 42 generations. So just like maybe the 42 months. And that could be a reason that was put in there. To show that's a whole period of time there. So the two witnesses, the good guys, their time is 1260 days. You can see that in Revelation 11.3. We just went through it. You can also see it in 12.6. The woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there 1,203 square days. That's 1,260 days. She went into the wilderness just like here there in the wilderness. Same thing. It's good guy time. Then the next one talks about the woman again and here again we're talking about the same woman this is revelation 12 14 a few verses later and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness under her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent we're going to get more into the serpent in a second so i wanted to just highlight that so this time, times and a half, why did they switch? The first time they talk about the woman, they're saying 1260 days, so we know she's a good guy. But why are we talking about, why do we go from that to times, time and a half a time? Well, the reason be is because he's trying to draw your attention to Daniel, and especially Daniel chapter 12. So both of those are, those are the good guys. This is just a slide so you can see the, the, the 1260 days of the woman and the woman's time, times and a half. It's both three and a half years, but it's the same idea. that Those equal each other, but the times, time, and a half a time is drawn there because of Daniel. This is in Daniel chapter 12, and I heard of the man clothed in linen, which was upon the face of the waters of the river, and he held up his right hand and his left hand unto the heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time, times, and a half, when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people. All these things shall be finished. Nothing happened, Daniel, and I went over this already in chapter 10, so you've got to go back and watch Daniel chapter 12, because I go completely through Daniel chapter 12 in uh, Revelation chapter 10. 
But anyways, I'm going to just show you a few things today, but this time, times and a half, that three and a half years, nothing happened three and a half years after Daniel made this prophecy. So it's a, it's a long period of time. The scattering of the power of the holy people didn't happen three and a half years after that. It happened in 70 weeks, really, and even after that. That's when the scattering of the power of the holy people was, you could say it in 70 A.D. The time of Daniel to Jesus is basically that time's time and a half. And then there's a time from Jesus to the last day, which I think is what we're looking at. There is when all these things shall be finished. So that's 490 years to get to Christ, and it's over 2,000 years now. Or almost 2,000 years. This is a long period of time, this time, times and a half. And I think that's what they're drawing this to, showing you that took 490 years for that to happen the first time. So that's why he's drawing us back to it so we could see, well, that's a long period of time. So there's the already and not yet. The already, Christ already died on the cross, but we have not yet seen the last day. They're looking forward to three and a half years, at a time, times and a half, and then we're looking back at three and a half years also to what happened with Daniel, to Daniel's time. And this is the way I look at that, too. They're both looking inward, both towards the cross all that time. Or you could say they're looking outward from that time, the cross. Everything happens at the cross. See, the two witnesses, they're looking at the, on the mercy seat there. Blessed that he that waits until that. I ain't going to go over that. You've got to go back and watch the old one. If you didn't see it, you can watch it, and you'll learn all that stuff. But all the time is seven years. So the three and a half years is the old covenant. It's from Daniel to Jesus, the cross. You could say till 70 AD in a sense, but really he's looking forward to cross. This is the beginning of the week, 70th week. There's the cross. That's what he's looking forward to. Same with from the cross, the whole church age. It's the other three and a half years. All the time is seven years. Seven's always complete. Seven's always complete in the book of Revelation. Seven's always complete. Daniel's time, too. Every, everyone. It's always a half. Three and a half would be a half of it. So the law and the prophets, or Moses and Elijah, the legal age, some people call it that, that would be the first three and a half years, or 490 years, we'll put it there. This actually goes all the way back to Moses, though, so it's longer than that. You could probably say it's 2,000 years. And then we've had 2,000 years in the church age. Even though the, the prophecies was made at the time of Daniel, really the prophecy starts from the cross and goes outward. So it, even though Daniel made that prophecy 490 years, the prophecy encompasses the whole legal age, the whole law and the prophets. So the law being like a king, and then the prophets being like a priest. So we're kings and priests. We took over for the law and the prophets. So you see, John the Baptist, he was the Elijah, the witness that was to become. And then Jesus, the body of Christ, is king and priest, order of Melchizedek. He's both the king and priest. And we are in Jesus. We're dwelling in him. So we are kings and priests, royal priesthood, as Peter said. So all these together will make up the two witnesses as the church. We are the church. John the Baptist paved the way for the church and for Christ. So that's all part of the theme too. The law and prophets give way to the Holy Spirit and Christ, which is the church. Two witnesses. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. John the Baptist was the last of the witness of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. It's gone now. Elijah, no more. Now we have the body of Christ, the true witnesses, the church, the congregation, as we will, the saints. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there is not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding... He that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. 
And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you receive it, this is Elijah, which was for to come. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. We are now greater than he. The ones in the, the, the new covenant, the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. We receive, that's whole Jesus' message is about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, same thing. We're greater than John the Baptist. We're the two witnesses. He paved the way for us. We're the embodiment of Christ. John the Baptist says it here. John 3, 29. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoice greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, I must decrease. He's setting up, he's like the guy setting us up. We're the bride and Jesus is the bridegroom. He's the friend, he's setting us up with him. We, he's, he's happy for us, he's rejoicing for us. So here's another reason why the church age would be represented as three and a half years. See, the church follows in Christ's footsteps. See, Jesus' ministry on earth was three and a half years. So it only follows that the church would have the exact same time period of three and a half years or be represented as three and a half years as its ministry here on earth. See, remember the theme of this chapter that the church is Christians and Christians are Christ's followers. Christians abide in Christ. Christians sacrifice themselves as Christ did. Christians are to be Christ-like. So just like Christ had his ministry for three and a half years on earth, we're going to have our ministry here on earth for three and a half years. But it's a figurative period of time. So Jesus speaking in John 5, he says, I can of my own self do nothing. I hear, I judge, my judgment is just, because I speak not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but the things I say, that ye might be saved. He was a burning and shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself which has sent me has borne witness of me. Ye have never heard his voice at any time or seen his shape. Jesus is saying here, I have another witness, not just my own. I have my witness, but I also have the Father's witness. So there's two. Once again, two witnesses, always.